All right. Welcome all to Spring Clean Your Finances. First of all, we want to mention some of our upcoming webinars. In April, we have 10 Secrets to Thrifty Grocery Shopping for Nutritious Foods. You'll learn how to eat better and less. Also, on Wednesday, April the 26th, our financial webinar will be all about workplace benefits. We'll talk about some of the different benefits that you may get through your employer, whether you be private or government. And then in May, our nutrition team will be talking about making more nutrition, healthy meals at home. So for those of you who are new to us, we are part of the Extension Service, and the Extension Service is a nationwide outreach from the land-grant universities, bringing up bringing the research education down at the local level. And here in Florida, so we're part of the University of Florida, and all 67 counties in Florida have an extension presence, and most have a family consumer sciences agent, which is what our team consists of. I'm Julie England. I'm based out of Seminole County. Lisa Leslie is based out of Hillsborough County. Taylor Spangler is an adjunct lecturer and Florida Master Money Coordinator, America Saves Coordinator, all kinds of different things. She's based in Gainesville. And our overall team leader is Dr. Mike Gutter, who is at Gainesville as well. You'll notice over on the right side of the screen, there should be a box. If you don't see a box, hit the little red arrow, and the box will expand. It's got a place for you to download the materials. There's three materials in this week's um, handouts. Also, you can put in the chat box. You can write, type in a message. You can send to the entire audience, or you can send it to anyone in particular. And also, if you right-click on the little red arrow, and unclick the auto hide, the chat box will stay open during the entire presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll be emailing you out a very short evaluation. And it is very short, but it's also very important um, for you to fill it out because we really do need our feedback for improvement and also for our annual report. So let's talk about spring cleaning your finances. No one necessarily loves cleaning. But it's certainly important, and I would say, and at least in my not-so-humble opinion, making sure that your finances are cleaned up and organized can be more important than cleaning your house. So today we're going to talk about reducing paper clutter, talking about an organizing important paper documents. Then we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about digitalizing your financial life. And you know, digital organization, security, and of course we do want to remind you about the importance of taking steps to do a little spring cleaning on credit, debt, and taxes, and then thinking about planning for the future a bit. So starting off, let's think about your house and spring cleaning. If I walked into your house, are there piles? It was kind of interesting, Taylor came up with this fact that the average American household consumes about six pounds of paper, which is 23 pounds of wood, just from paper bills each year. That's just bills, let alone all the other stuff that is lying around your house and potentially piles that you're just going to get organized one of these days. And so organizing and or pitching some of these things from the pile, A, reduces the stress of looking for things because you know it's always when you need them most is when they're hardest to find. Also, the reduces that you may miss a payment, be late because you can't find them, and also thinking about accumulating dust, time spent cleaning. So lots of good reasons to do a little bit of spring cleaning of your finances around the house. So to start off, first of all, get rid of that useless stuff you have sitting around. So even before you start thinking about organizing your finances or your papers, you know, sort out that stuff, you know, those flyers, that junk mail that you never got around to doing anything with, throw it away. First of all, get rid of that stuff and then kind of make sub piles or preferably more organized piles or stacks of things by category. And then from the categories, then you can start filing. So sort by categories, you know, however you, what works for you, but you know, think about keeping investment stuff, tax stuff separate monthly bills, longer term pay, longer term things. So you put them in piles and then you would organize them hopefully by date, starting with the most recent date. 
depends on what works for you because you, if you don't find a system that works for you, you're not going to stick to it. And once you get some of these things filed, remember to purge your files annually. Because, for example, WT forms from last year's workplace, once they're actually on your, that you get your end of the year form, you don't need to keep all those papers from last year. So then you can, then you know that you can safely shred them, make sure that they match up. But also think about how you're going to safely store your important documents. And so here is, this is actually a list from last year's Declutter Your Financial Life program, but I really like it. It's just kind of, it's in your materials section. It's really kind of a nice checklist to think about what papers you have and what you might need and just some really good reminders. And we're going to go through some of this, but you might want to download this and check it out. Things that you want to make sure that you never toss are really important things on the next slide, Lisa, please. Really important things like that you can't replace or that are especially difficult to replace, but certainly birth and death certificates, marriage license, divorce decrees, your social security card, and military discharge paper, even if the person, uh, even if the spouse is deceased because there might be benefits, certainly immigration documents, life insurance policies, things, you know, ownership papers on things that you own. So these are all really important to make sure that you don't toss out when you're doing a pile, although it can be good to scan them and also have copies of them as well. Additionally, in, in the materials section, this is also from last year's Declutter Your Finances webinar, and we're not going to talk today about how long to keep documents, but we figured that there might be questions on that. So this document is an excellent one to, with reminders of, about what to keep, how long to keep them, and where to keep them. So when you reduce your accumulation, some things to think about to reduce your piles. Are you still getting paper deliveries? And even do you need paper deliveries? That's up for you to decide, but if they're just ending up on your kitchen counter or wherever that you really don't do much with them or file them, it might be a lot more convenient to get e-delivery of them and just put them in folders on your computer. And also bills. You know, I've certainly found that paying bills online has made my life easier and has also reduced the amount of paper showing up at my house. Some other ways to get rid of the clutter, it, the accumulation is not to bring it in your house. If you come in through your garage, throw that junk mail and stuff in the garbage can as you come in. Open your mail next to the waste basket or shredder so you open it up, you just immediately um, dump it. Also, say as we talk about digitizing, which I can't pronounce that well, um, things, think about scanning your receipts. Are you saving all these? receipts that you need. Certainly, lots of receipts you don't need to save. For example, your grocery receipts, once they appear on your credit, on your bank statement, if you're using a debit card, you can pitch them or, you know, your credit card receipts. But there's lots of ways that you can scan receipts. There's one called Cam Scanner. There's Cam Scanner app and there's certainly others. And I do want to mention, as we mentioned specific apps today, we are not specifically recommending one versus the other but we're just using them more for demonstration or reference. And then down at the bottom there's of the slide, there's a couple different places that you can reduce some of your pre-screened um, offers for credit cards and ads. So you can go on and you can go online and reduce some of the paper load that's coming into your house. Can I pop in here, Julie? Certainly. Great. So the cam scanner uh, suggestion, there are lots of options like this, um, but I think that this is especially important, Lisa and I were talking about the organization of reimbursements. So if anybody out there is in the position where they purchase things with their own money and wait for their employer to reimburse them, or anybody who has lots of expenses that they're able to deduct from their taxes, this is really important because it helps me at least get organized. If I buy gas with my own money, I can take a picture of that, uh, sign the receipt, maybe give whatever information I need, and then put it in a folder. Save it as a PDF. I don't have to worry about the accumulation of paper. <laughs> 
So I keep an envelope, um, you know, have sort of a backup of things for work. But if you get to tax season and you're like, oh, I know I could have deducted some of those expenses, what were they? Uh, and you're trying to go back to last January, this can be a really great tool to keep yourself organized throughout the year and make sure that you're actually getting credit uh, for the things that you do because you're able to justify them. Great point. Thanks. And so what I, what I do also in my home filing is I have a file that says taxes current. So anything that I get that might be related to that tax year, I just automatically throw it in that folder. So, but also certainly if you're deducting things, especially as Taylor mentioned related to the receipts, that's a great option. So how are you going to store all this stuff? Though you're reducing this, so we're going to talk about some different um, options. So there's, you know, the good old-fashioned way: a filing cabinet, paper, things like that. And do remember to purge, no matter how how you keep your documents. Do think about purging them because you could have clutter on your computer as well, and not be able to find things. But filing cabinet, the cloud, which Taylor's going to talk about, but also certainly just on your general home computer. But just remember that as technology changes, to make sure that you transfer your data to the new forms of storage. A lot of new computers, for example, my work computer doesn't have a disk drive for a CD. So if all my stuff was on a CD, I'd be out of luck if that was my home computer. And But on the next slide, we do have a picture. And this is also in the um, materials feed. For those of you who are a little bit more old-fashioned, who don't want to go all digital, we do have a di the link to the digital assets inventory sheet, which is from Rutgers. It's really a good way to make a list of where things they are, your passwords, uh, things like that, even security questions. And then, of course, you have to figure out where you're going to securely store this one as well. So lots of different things to know. Also. And Lisa may want to jump in on this one. There's a new Florida law as of July of this year, which allows your, fiduciary, your financial fiduciary, which would be somebody like your lawyer, to actually be able to manage or look at your digital assets as well as your paper assets. So it could be guardians, people with power of attorney, things like that. And so more information on this, you can go to the link at the bottom. And Lisa, do you want to? Clarify any of this? Yeah, well, I, I think not a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you said. I think you said it. Um, and when they're talking about digital assets, they mean both your. Um, well, you think of your bank statements, your your investments, your those kind of accounts, but also your um, your other types of things like your Facebook account, your Instagram account, all all your digital assets. And um, some of them may not have monetary value, but you may want someone to designate someone to handle those for you. Um, in case something happens, um, because they have a lot of um, other value, uh, sentimental value or, or other types of value. Great. Thank you. And um, from, so from here, we're going to move on to the cloud. I read an article fairly recently about that many people still think the cloud is that your information is just out there floating around basically in the universe somewhere. <laughs> and so that's not true. And so Taylor's going to talk a little bit about that. Great. Thanks, Julie. So yes, the cloud is not uh, weather formation. The cloud is not um, floating through the air. It looks a lot like this. It looks like data storage centers. Uh, the clouds are really just remote servers that are storing your data for personal use, corporations use these, governments use these. Um, instead of everything being stored on a personal device, like your own computer or phone or whatever system that you're using, you are able to access them remotely and they're really stored somewhere else. So um, you save storage space on your own device, especially if you're um, looking at big files. So if you're a photographer and you have lots of really high resolution images, you might choose to, to put things on the cloud because you can't store everything on your computer, right? Uh, there's lots of different options. Some are freed, some are paid. Um, there's definitely some security concerns. Um, you guys can jump into the chat box. Did anybody have any issues uh, last week, two weeks ago, when the Amazon Web Services servers went out? 
I know here at the University of Florida we use an e-learning platform called Canvas and it was affected by this outage. So there was one little line in the code that a developer had um, edited in the Amazon Web Services uh, server system and there were tons of websites that had issues last week and people weren't able to access them. So uh, this can definitely happen. Um, primary concern for most users is security. If you're storing, you know, some Word documents that would be helpful for you to have at work, maybe this isn't a big concern. If you're storing personal, private personal information, um, if you're a hospital system storing patient records, if you're personally storing a lot of financial information, um, if you're a photographer storing all of your photos and that's your livelihood, uh, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to have access to it, that there aren't going to be data breaches, especially for that sensitive information. So uh, do your research as you're looking at different options for cloud storage um, and really see what are their security protocol, um, how are they guaranteeing that your information is going to be safe. So here's a couple examples. Again, our note, these are just examples. We aren't endorsing any of these um, specifically, but Dropbox, Microsoft's OneDrive, Google Drive, Apple iCloud, these are all very general. You could really put anything in them. Some of them will have uh, specific storage limits for free users, and then you can upgrade maybe to a larger amount um, if you pay. Some companies will support these, so maybe your employer already encourages or maybe mandates that you're using one of these internally for storing work files. Um, some of them come on specific devices. So if you have a Google phone um, or an Apple computer, then maybe these are already kind of built in to the system and you have the option to use them or not. Um, Lisa, if I click on these links, will will we see them live? Here I can I can do that. Okay. Hopefully. Should have brought those over. So we're going to show an example here again, not an endorsement of fidelity, but this is one that's specifically for our financial things. So we're looking at critical documents. This isn't where you sort, store your shopping list, right? This is where you're putting um, more sensitive information, making sure that you do have the ability to share it with people who you want to share it with, and the people who you don't want to see it don't have access. So you can do this um, as a const okay. So yeah, we can see buying or renting a home, just keeping all of your family documents safe. This is you know, fireproof and floodproof and robbery proof. Um, if you're worried about having things in your home, if you maybe are sending a student off to college and you're worried about, you know, them keeping track of all of this as they move from dorms to different apartments, uh, this can be really good. If something happens to you while you're traveling, this is a great option for you to have somebody who you trust. Maybe it's that fiduciary, maybe it's a spouse or a child or a parent, but somebody who's able to access those things. If they need to be able to get your birth certificate, get um, health information, tax information, you know, financial information, then this can be uh, a powerful tool to be able to share that, get the things that you want when you need them, and feel that they're going to be safe when you don't. And that's a good point, Wendy. Is there a fact sheet um, that might provide what to look for when researching clouds? I don't think so, but maybe we can work on a fact sheet. <laughs> Wendy's giving us a to-do list. I like it. <laughs> and and I think we brought up the one about fidelity because we were just talking about it and and thinking that um, companies like this, investment companies, banks, to attract customers, it's likely that more companies will start doing doing this. And since they already secure a lot of documents and they're in that business, um, it it may fit well with what they're doing. I would expect probably if. You know, one company's doing it, probably some other ones. I was unfamiliar with it until um, I have a Fidelity account, and they sent out an email mentioning it conveniently last week so we could mention it. <laughs> but one would assume if one of the biggies does it, that the others will too. Yeah, I think you're right. This is a trend we're going to see more of, less of people buying safes and, uh, you know, in-home security for paper documents. Not that we don't still need those options, uh, but the, the idea that we would have uh, digital versions, I think, is definitely the future. 
Great. Okay. So this is maybe more of those things like shopping lists. So this is um, an option we're going to talk about digital notebooks. And these come in lots of different forms, but the idea here is instead of Lisa's sticky note that tells her to record, <laughs> or maybe me jotting down shopping lists on the back of receipts or whatever paper I can find, making kind of disjointed notes in my phone or sending an email to myself, which is a thing I still do, um, that we have a little more structure to the way that we give ourselves reminders and sort of more casual information. So this isn't something that I would need to put in the Fidelity uh, safe, right? This is something I want to have access to. I'm organizing and storing sort of everyday notes that would maybe right now typically be put on paper and get uh, added to that paper mess that Julie talked about. So these are notes to myself, um, a way to organize photos, if there's a website that I want to reference. And the benefit of these is that I can get them in multiple ways. So a sticky note that I put on my computer at work doesn't help me a lot if I go home and then want to look up that website, right? If I'm at the store and I wrote that shopping list and left it at home, it's not very helpful. So many of us have our mobile devices, our cell phones with us, all the time, no matter where we are, so we can get to these, you know, this information wherever we are. If we're at the grocery store, uh, were we out of milk or eggs? I can't remember. I can quickly check that shopping list. I can share it with other people. I can search maybe a, a hashtag. If I'm planning a party, I could hashtag uh, Viking River Cruise Taylor's 30th birthday um, or whatever it is that I can have some sort of tag. Some of these have native tagging, hashtagging capabilities built in um, and then some options between totally web-based app-based, things that you can transfer and, and jump around between maybe a computer, laptop, desktop, whatever, and mobile devices. So here's a couple examples, again, not uh, endorsing any of these, but some examples of the more popular ones. So OneNote is the Microsoft product. If you're already working on a Microsoft machine, that's your operating system, uh, you have Windows and you have Microsoft uh, office suite, then you've probably seen OneNote. You might have it on the computer that you're using right now. Um, Evernote is a web-based program, and Google Keep is sort of similar if you're using Google devices. Uh, they're kind of already built in, so you can add extensions into your browsers for these. So if I'm on a website and I'm like, oh, that's really cool, I want to make a note about this, I could just hit my little Google Keep extension, it's a little light bulb for Google, um, and I can add that to a specific list or to a specific uh, topic that I have, a note section, reminder, shopping list, wherever it is, um, and be able to organize things a little bit better. I can choose to share things or not. Um, so we have a question for you guys, which is, do you have a favorite digital notebook? Are you using any of these right now? Um, if you can kind of share your knowledge with our webinar um, guest here today, are there certain features that you like or dislike? I'll say I like having an extension in my browser, which just means if I'm looking at a page, I don't have to go googlekeep.com and, you know, find it, I can just click that little light bulb and choose what I want to add. Great, Jennifer. So Jennifer uses Evernote. Can you tell us, is it more for personal use? Are you guys using this for work? Are you sharing it in your household? Um, Amy's a Pinterest fan. I got to say I like Pinterest as well, too. Um, instead of having the magazine pages and trying to reference things back, it's a lot easier to search and find things within Pinterest. That's a great suggestion especially for more visual pins. So um, if you're looking at specific, okay, great, uh, specific images that you want to capture, Pinterest is a good choice. So this is Evernote. You can see um, different lists that you can make. You can transfer around between your computer and your phone. It's wherever you are. Um, you can search things really easily. So this is a big advantage over a paper system. If I leave myself notes, then I have to remember where I put that note. 
and sometimes my handwriting maybe won't make a lot of sense. Uh, many of these you have the ability to take pictures of things. So like I know in the Google version and I think with Evernote, if somebody gives me a business card at a conference, I can quickly take a picture of that and it will convert the images that it sees on that business card to text. So now I have a real true contact instead of a piece of paper that's going to get lost in my luggage before I make it home. Um, so, so some of those are kind of that bridging that gap, helping to go between this very paper-filled world to a more digital world. Um, I had to copy and paste this one when I looked at it, Lisa. The link wasn't working. So we're going to look at kind of a comparison between OneNote and Evernote. And again, if you're using um, other Microsoft products, especially at your place of employment, this might be already built into what you're doing. Um, but we can compare side-by-side uh, -side some of the differences between OneNote and Evernote. If you scroll down a little bit, Lisa. Yeah, so you can see, you know, how do they work? What do they sync from? Do I have to pay to get certain features? Um, what's the sharing capability? All of those things. So um, I see some more comments over here in the box. Mainly personal use, um, not really sharing some of these things. I'm about to be made of honor for the third time in as many years, and so I have lots of shared wedding boards that... <laughs> I get lots of notifications when the bride thinks that a certain um, table runner is going to look really cute. I get a notification. Sometimes I would like to mute that and get less information. So um, it, it really depends on how you want to use this. If it's information that you really want or just kind of noise. If uh, Jennifer used to have a bunch of binders full of magazine clippings and different paper ideas, maybe that was hard to go through and she would um, have trouble finding something. If six months later she wanted to reference it, then it might be hard. But Pinterest is a lot easier and she's able to find that quickly. If she never looks anything back up, then um, it might not be as useful. So uh, OneNote is useful for sharing information at work. Um, I think that that's true, especially if you have colleagues who are using this. If you're working on projects together, um, if you want to be able to have multiple people editing different things, then going to the cloud is a much smoother system than, um, okay, let me email this version to you. Oh, no, I was working from a different version. I already changed this. Uh, you know, it can kind of expedite those edits and make everybody understand what version you're working from a little bit easier. Yeah, Dropbox, OneDrive to use for work. Uh, through the university system, we now have permission kind of to use both of these. Um, and different colleagues prefer different ones. So sometimes you are still in that situation of ba bouncing back and forth between platforms, uh, which, you know, can be difficult to manage if you have lots of different collaborative projects. All right, great. So, um, some general notes for all of our digital lives about passwords here, right? Passwords are like the key to your safe. If you made a bunch of copies of the key to your safe and didn't pay attention to them, uh, you would expect maybe to have a security breach. If we are making easy passwords, if we're writing passwords down where people can see them, even if we're typing them in and public places. I can't tell you how often I see people typing in passwords on their phone in very clear eyesight of strangers. Um, so just some general common sense about where we store our passwords I think is an important note here at the beginning, but all of us could take this opportunity as we spring clean our finances to just give a little dusting to our cyber cybersecurity. So if there's one takeaway today, one challenge is to really look at all of your passwords, maybe make them stronger today. Don't use username, your own name, your child's name, your pet's name. Really any words or names should not be in your password. Um, sometimes people will do a combination of letters and numbers that still create a word that they can remember, uh, but you're using maybe a 1 as an L or a 3 as an E or a 0 as you know an O, something like that to kind of mix it up a little bit. But use a mix of characters. Using different passwords for each site 
um, I think is really important. So different characters could be yeah, letters, numbers, the, what we call special characters, maybe an exclamation point or an at symbol or a question mark, something like that. Uh, maybe after today you'll use a money sign. But something to kind of mix it up. You can put spaces in passwords, uh, but using different characters, using different passwords, um, consider using a password manager. Uh, so password manager sites or apps are a way that you create one master password. Typically it's very long, um, contains a, definitely a mix of characters, but that's really the only password that you remember. So it's long, but it's the only information you have to keep in your head. Um, and then the password manager will create totally random passwords for all the different sites that you visit. Um, so. There's a couple notes here on why this could be maybe good or bad, but the reason that we need something like this is that hackers can steal millions of passwords from websites, that we need strong and different passwords for each site, each site that we visit, but there's sort of a challenge here. Can I hold in my head the dozens of different passwords for every site that I visit? Maybe, but it's going to be a challenge. I feel like People in my generation are bad at even remembering a 10-digit phone number uh, compared to my parents. I can still remember my home phone number from when I grew up, but I could not tell you my mom's cell phone number today. Um, so I think that moving to a system like this can, can help relieve us of that mental burden of trying to remember these and actually do a better job than we do. So having a, a system make totally random passwords is better than us because we tend to stick to certain words or numbers or things that we're going to remember because they're personal to us and that makes us more vulnerable to a breach. Uh, password stealing technology is becoming increasingly good for stealing them, Julie says, absolutely. Uh, there's whole industries to try to obtain these because it means money. If you're able to obtain someone's uh, password to get into their credit card, to get into um, bank accounts, or even just your Amazon shopping profile, if you've linked a card to it, then that's the ability for someone else to shop on your behalf, right? So uh, really consider what password manager you're using. Uh, I'll preempt Wendy's question, which is I don't really have a fact sheet, but looking at uh, the different options, looking at the security history of different password managers, if they've had a breach in the past, what did they change to become safer in the future? How do you trust them? Um, and then making sure that it's compatible with the things that you want to use. So two-factor two authentication might mean that I have my cell phone number connected as well as an email and I can get a text to verify. Um, sometimes we can use a fingerprint or some kind of biometric information to verify who we are, but that we're able to verify our identi identity in more than one way. Okay, so we'll open it up to the group. Has anybody used a password manager? Some examples are like LastPass is a popular one. Um, do you use a system like this? Is anybody still using a notebook where they write down all their passwords? <laughs> we'll call you out. Um, well, no. <laughs> but I do want to mention, I'm not that bad, but I do want to mention back to the passwords about, it's really interesting, so when they talk about names, it's not even just names or whatever that are associated with you, but a name or word in general, that right. these password stealing um, programs will look for words. And it was also kind of interesting when I was doing some of the research on this, that, that, that the majority that large numbers of people start their password with a capital consonant and then a small vowel. Interesting. And so they look for they look for these. The programs will automatically look for them. So think about that you don't start with a capital. You might start with, you know, a small, you might start yeah. with a, a symbol, anything. But don't put any names or any words. Kind of like that commercial that's on TV when they ask the guy with the missile codes what his <laughs> password is and it's, I hate my job. Not real secure. Yeah, absolutely. Don't make your pin your birthday um, special dates. That It's hard as humans to be random. We like patterns. We Our brains want to find patterns. So the more, even if it just means slamming your hand down on the keyboard and just getting to eight characters or more um, and then committing it to memory, but the more you can remove your own personal 
uh, likes or dislikes, whatever, into the creation of your password, the stronger they're going to be because it's they're, they need to be unguessable. If you guessed it, if you made it up in the first place, then your own human pattern loving behavior went into that. Um, so I, I like there's a question in the box, if you're broke and have bad credit, do you still have valuable information to a hacker? Potentially, oh, yes. Amy. I mean, if you're uh, paying utility bills, if you're, you know, just the basics of your life, if you've digitized some of your financial life to make things easier for you, maybe even uh, to save money. So sometimes different loans, I think for federal student loans, if you go all digital, you actually save a, a small, it's less than a percentage, but a small a portion of a percent on the interest that you're going to pay. So it's real money uh, for people who might be broke, might not have thousands of dollars sitting in an account waiting to be stolen. There's still access to that information and could leave you very vulnerable if you didn't have much of a cushion to bounce back from that. So I think we all need to protect uh, our assets, even if you don't feel that you have a ton of assets, or maybe you're giving this example for someone else. But uh, I, I think it's important to protect whatever digital assets that you do have. So we have a question from Kathleen. Um, Oh, no, it's just a statement. I keep an Excel spreadsheet of passwords, password protect the file, as well as my devices, uh, easy to remember to more than 30 sites passwords. Exactly. So the more we start to digitize this, uh, the more sites there are to remember. I have been guilt guilty in the past of just kind of using the same or very similar passwords for different sites because they are hard to remember. It's hard to, to keep all of that in your brain. Uh, some sites will require that you change your passwords frequently if you... Uh, work for UF, you have to change your main login password once a year, and so I'll often take that opportunity to refresh some of my other ones as well. Uh, Virusware has a place to save passwords. That seems like a, a good add-on for that product for people worried about cybersecurity. Anywhere else that people are um, using other tools besides the paper notebook to save their passwords? I guess hiding the USB with it on in your house doesn't really count as overly secure. <laughs> oh, my problem would be that I'd end up losing the USB and I could never track it down to find it. Accidentally suck it up in the vacuum or whatever. Uh, yeah, maybe not the most secure. <laughs> but we can encrypt USBs. We can password protect files. So again, if there's one long, seemingly random master password that can, you can use to protect whatever second location you're using to, to store passwords, I think that that's a good uh, practice to help keep yourself more secure, but not lock yourself out of accounts that you need to get into, right? If you make a password that you can't remember and that you can't access, then that's not useful to you either because then you've just created a headache of trying to get into your own accounts that you should be able to. So uh, some things to think about. Okay. okay, with that, we're going to um, talk, we talked a little bit about getting organized, so we're going to talk about some things to look at in your finances. Um, you know, as, as Julie mentioned, as you're organizing your finances, it's a good time to take a look as you're organizing your records, take a look at your finances, um, review what you owe. Um, it's tax time's a good time to look. Um, what are all my account balances? What interest rates am I paying? Have you checked your credit report? Look for errors. Um, see if there's any accounts... Um, any open accounts you want to close. And, and be careful, though, with credit cards. Um, I kind of stick by the rule. If there's a balance on it, um, doesn't mean you have to use it anymore. Chop it up with the information, knowing how to close it. But don't close a credit card until you've zeroed out the balance. That could have a negative effect on your score. Um, and in regards to tax time, if you do get a big run refund, think about how you're going to use it. Um, maybe pay down high interest debt. And in fact, if you are getting a big refund, a good time to see, okay, could I, would it be a little better if I got more money in my check back every month? Um, I know um, some of my mentors have worked with folks here and they were getting big refunds, but they're carrying credit card debt all year. So a way to kind of really make your finances, get, get them in better shape and spruced up, get a little more back in your paycheck. Um, and pay off that extra, extra debt. Or if you do get a refund again, think about how you're going to use it. Um, we have a note here, March and June are five Friday months, so you use the extra paychecks to tackle debt. And again, it goes with getting organized, with looking at the debt, saying, okay, this is where I stand. 
and this is where I want to go. Um, and, and here's a note, paying small balance debts can provide relief, um, even if they don't carry high interest, because it can feel good. And we know a lot about how we manage our personal finances has a lot to do with, um, has a lot to do with emotion. Um, so if we can make ourselves feel better, if we can be better organized, if we can get rid of a lot of little nagging debts around, that can make us feel better and make us more productive in, in the long run. And here are some, so a good app, Utah Extension, University of Utah, uh, and an extension there. They developed the PowerPay app, and now it is online, or you can use it if you have a, an Apple, uh, Apple iPhone product or um, an iPad. I think I downloaded it once on my iPad. Um, but this one is a wonderful app. To, um, and a wonderful thing, even if you just use it online, because you can um, organize your information in one place, and you really don't have to put account numbers. Interestingly, it's a secured site. I guess they just out of an abundance of caution, they put a secure site, but you can just put in debt one, two, three, four, whatever debts you have, and make a plan to pay those off, and then take a look at it, you know, regularly, and see how you're doing. It gives a nice calendar where it will show you when your, when your debts are paid off to the month and year, and that can really help motivate, and it can show if you add extra payments, um, how that would affect it. Um, if you pay off the little ones first, or if you pay work on the high interest, it's really a great way to take a look at, at your debt situation. Okay, it is tax time, and a lot of us are immersed in it. <laughs> um, so it's a good time to take a look at a few numbers. Um, while you're getting organized, think about, um, do you know these numbers? Do you know what your adjusted gross income is? What your taxable income is? What marginal tax rate? These are numbers that you sh should know. They're going to help planning. And um, um, why do we care about our adjustable tax rate? Well, that number can affect your what credits you're eligible for, what tax deductions you can take, take um, federal student aid if you're a student or if you're a parent of a student who's a dependent, these may affect that aid. Um, but you can find your adjusted gross income on line 37 of your 1040 as shown here in this slide. Um, so you want to take a look at that number and know that there's a difference here. When you say adjusted gross income, taxable income, just your gross gross income, which is your gross income, those are all different numbers. Those are numbers you really want to be aware of to help you plan. So um, we know the adjusted gross income is found here on your line 37. It's, um, so take a look at that number. Then you want to think about also, what's my taxable income? Because your taxable income is different. Your taxable income is your what your income is after you've reduced after it's been reduced by your deductions, um, the exemptions that you might take for yourself, your spouse, your dependent. Um, so all of that reduces it to where you get a taxable what your taxable income number is. And the reason you want to know that it's good to know um, how where what what part of your income is taxable and what is not. A lot of folks are surprised to find, if you see here on this, a lot of folks are find out, oh look, Social Security benefits, only some of it was taxable, um, or different uh, types of things. But it's also very important to help you know what your marginal tax rate is. Because as you can see here, these are the tax rates, and it's based on taxable income, not gross income. So knowing your marginal tax rate really can help you make some financial decisions. It can help keep you in a tax bracket. Um, if you defer some money, you can keep yourself in a lower tax bracket, uh, for instance, using flexible spending accounts or retirement accounts. And also deciding, do I would a Roth or a traditional IRA account be better for me or a Roth or traditional retirement account be better? What tax rate am I in now? That can help you decide, okay, and, and it does get a little easier as you get closer to retirement, uh, but it's good to know where, what situation you're in as you start planning ahead. So if you take a look, and again, you have these on the slides, take a look at your taxable income and see what tax bracket are you in. And they're listed, um, they're li listed here. And then also know that long-term capital gains rates are um, taxed at a lower rate 
for folks in the 10% and the 15% tax brackets. So um, like this, uh, this is 10% tax bracket, 15% tax bracket. Those folks pay right now. Now this could change and that's another reason to play as things are being discussed. Um, see where you stand so you know how that's going to affect you. Okay, so got to turn off the drawing tool. All right, so that's there. Okay, and also just to let you know, when you're thinking about how you can affect your tax situation, there's still time to make 2016 contribution to um, a, a traditional or a Roth IRA. Um, and that's for 2016. You have up until the tax filing deadline, which this year is April 18, 2017. So there are there is time to make that. And just know if you're at that point where you need to take required minimum distributions, the information about when to take those is here as well. Um, so you want to do that and then the site for more information. And know that there are IRA contribution limits. Um, 5,500 if you're uh, age 50 or, excuse me, if you're under age 50 and then 6,500 age 50 or older. And do know, again, there, there are deduction limits for the traditional IRA and that depends on whether you're covered by a retirement plan. And again, that's why you want to know what your adjusted gross income is. And if you go to the site, it'll tell you modified adjusted gross income, you back out. Um, some some types of adjustments it shows you just how to do it. But as you're deciding whether to put money in the traditional or the Roth, and then the Roth, there are it is not deductible, but there are contribution limits. And especially if you're just starting out, um, you want to think about um, you want to think about if if you're early in your career, you might want to give Roth IRAs a, a, a look, um, and you've got a long while till retirement. And I see there's a question here. Yes, good, good comment there. I like to play around on my tax software and figure out, Julie's got good information there to figure out how, how will that affect my return if I contribute to a deductible IRA. Okay, so do you have any suggestions for apps that can keep track of taxes who don't get taxes taken out of their paycheck? Hmm, so for instance, somebody who's self-employed. Um, not that I can think of. I don't know, Julie. If, if the idea, I haven't though, seen any of those, but you know, I don't. You know, I. If I'm not sure that if you didn't use, you know, use tax software, you could actually even use the past year's one to kind of maybe get an idea. That that is a new one on me. Yeah, I think that this is really important. A lot of people are going to like 1099 work if you're adding even just a side, you know, hustle, uh, if you will, <laughs> in 1099. I think a good place to look, again, this isn't an endorsement of a particular product, but something like QuickBooks or QuickBooks Online, um, you can do things on the go. You can track a lot of business-related things if you're a vendor through online sites, like if you're selling things on Etsy um, or eBay or something, then there's an easy way to sync those payments. I'm looking up some of this stuff right now um, as I look. There's recommendations for something called Invoice ASAP. So if you're a freelancer who's getting payments from people, um, that could be an option. I'm going to poke around here on a, a couple sites and then I'll link here in the chat box for you, Amy. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, because as you point out, that is very important, very important to keep records. And if you just use even the typical software, because I think Taylor's right, you want to keep good records, but you also probably want to make uh, payments, estimated payments to the IRS. And if you use even a TurboTax or an H&R Block online, they can help you print out, that software will help you print out the vouchers and estimate what to pay ahead because there is a penalty if you owe, generally speaking, there's a few other rules, but generally speaking, um, if you owe more than $1,000 or more, you're going to have a little bit of a penalty. So you want to make make sure that, the, that you're following the pay as you go and not waiting to the end of the year if you're bringing in a lot of extra income. Also, if you're making estimated taxes, one year, the, the next year, the IRS will send you um, envelopes and the vouchers as well to, uh, for making estimated taxes in the coming year. 
Good, good so question. If you're made, so, so if you're, um, but if you do have a business that's not being taken out, yes, there's certainly the potential for a really nasty surprise come April. So either ta having more money taken out of, if you have a regular job, having money taken out or making estimated payments would be, certainly be Yeah, I think that eliminated that shock. Cool. A lot of people I know who do some sort of side hustle, right? If they're selling uh, things through an online store, if they're driving for one of the ride-sharing companies, um, but they do have a traditional job, that is often what they'll do. They'll offset that anticipated tax burden by having increasing their withholding at their traditional job. In many of these uh, 1099 kind of tech companies that don't view you as an employer, they still do some of this for you. Like I know one of the ride-sharing companies will send you quarterly reports that says, here's how much we say that you earned, here's what your tax liability is, and then give you the option like, do you want to pay this now? Um, and so you have that kind of quarterly check-in instead of a surprise come spring, oh, I wasn't planning for this. Um, and so it gives you those kind of nudges throughout the year. That's not true for all 1099 work, so it really depends. But uh, hopefully you can share some of these resources uh, Amy with your friend and they can do the planning. I think that's the most important thing is that they're expecting to have this tax bill um, and there's a, a couple different strategies that they could use throughout the year to make sure that they are prepared. And also keep track of expenses and things you can deduct because that can reduce your income. So knowing those rules of what you can you can deduct getting a little familiar with the Schedule C and a Schedule C EZ and which one you have to file um, those are what, and if you go irs.gov, um, they, you know, look for those those schedules to understand what, what you can deduct to make your income less. All right, so the big thing here, we want to talk about plan for the future. We want to get organized. We want to keep track of our finances. And the idea is think about where we want to be in five years, in 10 years. Because um, what I'm going to do today, what I, you know, just getting organized, clearing my mind so I can think turn to clear vision, yeah, organization, clearing the space, planning ahead, it can really, um, really benefit us professionally, personally, um, and just make us feel better. So that's kind of the key here, the kind of thing we're getting at. Organ get organized, take a look, um, maybe work on a few things. I know I will be looking for a password manager here <laughs> because it's just, you know, it can be overwhelming and we don't want to worry about little stupid things. All right, so um, one, one thing here, and Julie put this in here about um, start tracking your net worth. A good thing to do at least once a year, again, where am I today and where, where, am I, where do I want to be? So taking a look here, what are my assets? What are my liabilities? And then, you know, taking a look next year, how am I doing? And there's some resources to help you learn more um, because these are all good tools to say this is where I am and take a check year to year to see where you're going. Uh, and we just want to put a plug in here. We did a couple of estate planning webinars last year, and we'll have some more resources coming out. But take a look. Have you updated your beneficiaries? Uh, a great gift to give your, your, your family is a, an estate plan. Um, be sure, especially if you have minors, if you have dependent children, you want to designate guardians. Um, you don't want, do you want to designate the guardian or do you want to have the court designate a guardian? So I think that's a consideration. Probably best, I bet, I bet folks with kids, they want to make the call on that one. And then you may want to consider a trust. Uh, if you have a, a minor child, you, you know, you want to talk to an attorney because you can't just say, okay, minor child gets somebody, an adult is going to have to handle assets for the minor child. They can't legally hand it. And we've got our webinar links here. Um, so, and some of those have additional resources underneath in the YouTube section in the little box below it. All right, so we've talked about all this fun stuff. So now plan some fun, plan ahead while you reward yourself. Think about what are my goals for the summer, for maybe a vacation during the holidays. Um, you know, as you're looking at things over, plan for some fun, take some, make some plans, plan ahead for a trip or a special thing. Um, is there anything else, if you're thinking of special things, what you think you want to, you know, what you want to plan for, th think about what you 
what's important and get the family together and starting putting a little away for that, making a plan uh, once you get all organized. So um, with that, Taylor, Julie, do you guys have any any parting words of wisdom? Well, just to think about, you know, to think ahead for what you're doing for this summer if you're going to do it. You, once you're organized, you may have more money than you thought to go, or sadly, you might realize that maybe it should be a year for staycation and day trips. So kind of cleaning up those finances and getting organized and knowing what you have, what, where it's going, can help you with some of this decision making. Great, and I, I really like the idea of, of rewarding yourself, yeah. If you cleaned your whole house, you spent a whole weekend cleaning your whole house top to bottom, you'd probably take yourself out to dinner or do something nice for yourself to reward yourself. So uh, maybe getting the family together and planning something fun together, thinking about these financial goals could be a reward for doing the hard work of getting organized and redoing all your passwords and uh, making sure that your uh, digital and paper lives are, you know, in check financially. Uh, so give yourself something to look forward to because we know this is not the most fun activity to do, uh, but it's really important. And it can feel so good when you do it. Um, it really can. Yeah. All right. So any other comments, participants? Thank you for sharing. You shared a lot of good information. We appreciate the questions and the comments. Um, Anyone has any other comments? Otherwise, we will send a reminder, so our, our survey. Hopefully, you won't have to get any reminders. <laughs> but we do like your constructive criticism. Um, we will be planning additional webinars. Um, so any any what you like to see, what you didn't like, um, we would appreciate that. And you can always send us ideas for future webinars, too. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone have a, a great afternoon and take care. Enjoy the good weather. Thanks, Lisa. Bye.